The book of Isaiah, part 6. In the last lecture, we had seen the Assyrian come, and we had seen the return of the, Christ, the true Christ. We had seen the destruction, the desolation, pronounced against Israel and pronounced against Judah. We had seen the Assyrian was going to come roaring in like a river, very similar to the book of Revelation where the flood was released out of the mouth of the dragon. And we had seen the desolation thereof. And we had seen that God would not forsake Israel, but would always leave a remnant. Those that clung to him, he would save. In other words, those that know the truth. As we enter this uh, next chapter, chapter 15, um, we're going to see the burden of Moab. Um, in the last lecture, in Isaiah 14, in case there was any doubt of who was being discussed, Lucifer was given by name. And he was put down to the sides of the pit, and the kings and the peoples that were in the pit, not necessarily to say in hell fire, but in the holding place of souls until judgment, uh, said unto Lucifer, are you become as one of us? In other words, are you as become as weak as us? And they narrowly looked upon him. And he was called a man there. He's called a man in a number of places. This doesn't mean he is a human. It means he is a male. That's all it means. It all It's, it's all it infers. So we're going to pick it up here with the burden of Moab. Um, Moab means of his father. Moab was one of the children of Lot, along with Ammon, by his own daughters, after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Moab is a uh, second cousin to uh, Abraham, since Lot was uh, his nephew. So, in other words, we're talking about other children of Adam here. In other words, the other peoples of the earth who are the children of Adam. And this is going to be what's brought upon them because of the destruction of the Antichrist, the desolation, and the return of the true Christ. So we're going to begin with Isaiah chapter 15 and verse 1. And before we do, let us go to our Father's throne in prayer. Glorious Heavenly Father, we come before you this day and we ask you to open our eyes and ears with knowledge. We ask you to share with us the truth, Father. We ask you to reveal to us secrets long hidden in your word. We ask, us to, we ask that you show us your overall plan, Father, both historical and to our time. We ask you to open the eyes and ears of all who study with us, Father, that they too may receive knowledge and understanding at the grace of your mighty hand. We ask that your hand always be upon these studies, Father, and that you be our light, that you shine in the path so that we know where to walk, to stay on the straight and narrow and not to turn to the right or to the left. And we ask these things, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yahushua the Messiah, Amen. So, Isaiah chapter 15 and verse 1. The burden of Moab, because in the night, R of Moab is laid waste and brought to silence. Because in the night, Kir of Moab is laid waste and brought to silence. In other words, these are two cities of Moab, and they're laid waste and brought to silence. In other words, there would be the sound of no voices in them. They're uh, desolated, in other words. And they're not only desolated by the desolator in, in historical times, which is to say the, the Assyrian, but also they're going to be desolated by the, uh, in our own time by uh, the desolator written of in Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 9, the abomination of desolation. But also, when Christ returns... They're going to realize what they did, and they're also they're going to be even worse shape. In other words, 
This is one reason why it says there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth, and men shall seek for death, but it shall flee away from them, and they shall not find it. Because they're going to be in their spiritual bodies, and they can't die. That is, until uh, judgment comes, and uh, judgment is up to the Lord, of course, as to who will be cast into the lake of fire and burned up and blotted out. Verse 2. He has gone up to Bajith, which is to say house, and it refers to the house of their gods, in other words, the gods that they worship, and to Dibon. Dibon means a wasting. Uh, basically, it means a waste of time. They've gone up to the house of their gods, which is a waste of time. The high places, in other words, the places of worship, to weep. And Moab shall howl over Nebo. Now, there's a twofold connotation to this. Me Nebo is, of course, the mountain. It's the mountain that Moses went up and died upon, and it's also the beginning of the name of Nebo or Nebuchadnezzar. But um, Nebo means the god of learning. And um, in their case, it would be their god of learning, what, the god that they have learned, Baal or Chemosh or Ashtoreth, whatever gods they're worshiping. It also infers their prophets. In other words, they're, they're going to howl over their prophets and to their gods. And over Mediba. In other words, uh, M Mediba means the waters of rest. So they're going to go up to the house of their gods, which is a waste of time, a wasting. And they're going to go to their prophets and their gods, their god of learning, over the uh, waters of rest. And for our time, what is the waters of rest? What is the living water? It is, of course, Jesus Christ. So they choose their false gods over the real gods. Or over the real God, in other words. On all their heads shall be baldness, and every beard cut off. Um, this is a sign of lamentation or um, mourning. It's also a sign of shame. In other words, the hair being missing from the head, being baldness, and I'm not talking about male pattern baldness. Men do go bald. That's got nothing to do with this. Christ is supposed to be our veil that we keep over our heads to protect us. So that's what's being inferred here. Again, these are the children of Adam. Verse 3. In the streets they shall gird themselves with sackcloth. And of course, when one girds himself with sackcloth, it is mourning. And on the tops of their houses and in their streets, everyone shall howl and weep abundantly. Again, wailing and gnashing of teeth, because they've been deceived. Verse 4. And Heshbon, Heshbon would be one of the stronghold cities of Moab, shall cry. And Eliah, which is another city, but Eliah means God ascending. In other words, they're going to cry in their stronghold with God ascending. Uh, this is one of the reasons why you have to study in Hebrew. Because if you try to read this and make sense of it in English, you're going to be totally lost as to the meaning of all this. It will not follow through. It will not come through. The thought will not be conveyed and you will completely miss it. Their voice shall even be heard unto Jahaz, and Jahaz means the trodden down. Therefore the armed soldiers of Moab shall cry out, and his life shall be grievous unto him. In other words, even their strongest men, their lives shall be grievous unto them. Uh, their souls shall be grievous unto them. And um, they're going to be grievous unto them because they have been deceived. Again, wailing and gnashing of teeth because they know they've been deceived. And in the historical time, this would be because they would be being overtaken by the conquerors that came in. The Assyrian, and eventually Babylon. Verse 5. My heart cry out, or, or my heart shall cry out for Moab. His fugitives shall flee unto Zor, and Zor means uh, a small place. An heifer of three years old for by mounting up of Luhith and weeping shall they go up to it. Luhith means tablets and uh, really has no um, um, 
meaning here other than the name of the place. For in the way of Horonaim, uh, Horonaim means uh, two caves or two ways. They shall raise and cry of destruction. In other words, what this is saying is they've got two choices here. Two caves, two ways. You could say uh, the right way and the wrong way. God's way or the other way. And they shall cry of, de of destruction. Obviously because they chose the wrong way. Verse 6. For the waters of Nimrim, which mean um, crystal clear or pure and clear, shall be desolate. And again, we know what the water, the living water is. And their waters shall be desolate. Uh, this is to say they shall be murky or um, bitter. And the hay is withered away, and the grass faileth, and there is no green thing. In other words, there is famine upon the land. And there will be famine upon the land during the time of the Assyrian, as well as famine for the end times, as written in Amos chapter 8. The famine for the end times is not for bread, in other words, not for that which feeds your flesh body, your stomach, but for hearing the word of God. In other words, understanding the word of God. Verse 7. Therefore the abundance they have gotten, which they have laid up, they shall carry away to the brook of the willows. In other words, all they have laid up in store is going to be stolen away. Their treasures are going to be taken away. And uh, you could even liken this to the uh, righteous robes or righteous works. What makes up your raiment in heaven? Well, what happens when all that is taken away? Well, you're standing there in your spirit spiritual body, buck naked. Verse 8. For the cry has gone out round about the borders of Moab, the howling thereof unto Eglium. Eglium means uh, double reservoir or two waters. And again, we've got the choice here. The two waters, the murky water, the bitter water, or the living water. And the howling thereof unto Bir Elim. Beralim means the well of God. So, uh, in other words, they're going to be lamenting that they didn't drink the waters of the well of God. Verse 9. And the waters of Daimon, which uh, Daimon means the riverbed, shall be full of blood. So, this lets you know what kind of desolation is going to come upon them. Uh, in the historical sense, there's going to be a big slaughter. In the spiritual sense, there's going to be a big slaughter of souls, uh, spiritually speaking. In other words, they're not going to be dead, but they're going to be desolated by the desolator. Uh, let's see, where were we? Verse 9. For the waters of Daimon, which is again, the riverbed shall be full of blood... And I will bring more upon Daimon, lions upon him that escapeth of Moab, and upon the remnant of the land. In other words, those that escape uh, are going to be overtaken by lions. Now, this doesn't mean escaped of the deception. This means that they're uh, going to be totally overwhelmed, totally destroyed. Verse 16. Excuse me, chapter 16 and verse 1. Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land, from Selah, which means rock, to the wilderness, unto the mount of the daughter of Zion. And of course, we know what the lamb is symbolic of, the lamb slain, concerning the daughter of Zion. Verse 2. For it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of her nest, so shall the daughters of Moab, or so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. And the fords is the fords of the river Arnon. In other words, they're going to be fleeing. And uh, there's not going to be anywhere for them to flee to, quite frankly. Verse 3. Take counsel, execute judgments, Make thy shadow as the night. In other words, be hidden. In the midst of noonday. 
In other words, make your shadow as it would be in the night in the midst of noonday. In other words, be hidden. Hide the outcast, bewray not him that wandereth. Verse 4. Let mine outcast dwell with thee, Moab. Be thou a covert to them from the face of the spoiler. Well, we know who the spoiler is. It is, of course, the king of Assyria historically, but the king of Assyria spiritually is um, the uh, Satan, the Antichrist. Uh, whether it's the, Syri- the Assyrian or the king of Babylon, it's still the same connotation. From the face of the spoiler, in other words, Satan Antichrist. For the extortioner is at an end. The spoiler seetheth, and the oppressors are, consu- are consumed out of the land. In other words, at the return of the true Christ, the spoiler is going to cease, and the oppressors are going to be consumed out of the land. And who are the oppressors? Well, they're his army, his locust army. Verse 5. And in mercy shall the throne be established. And he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. Now, of course, we're talking about the return of Christ here. Verse 6. We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud, even his haughtiness and his pride, and his wrath. But his lies shall not be so. In other words, they were very proud of their false gods, and they were very prideful and lifted up in pride in the days of their strength. But his lies shall not be so. Uh, uh, Not against Christ, anyway. Verse uh, verse 7. Therefore shall Moab howl for Moab. Everyone that howl for the foundations of Kirheseth shall ye mourn. Surely they are stricken, and Kirheseth means the uh, wall of the potsherds. And potsherds, of course, uh, having to do with broken vessels. And what are these vessels that we dwell in? They're clay vessels. Verse 8. For the fields of Heshbon, which is, again, one of the strongholds of Moab, languish. And the vine of Sibma, uh, Sibma means fragrance, the lords of the heathen, heathen have broken down the principal plants thereof. In other words, their gods have caused them to fail. They are come even unto Jazer, which means helped. They wandered through the wilderness... Her branches stretched out and are gone over the sea. Um, Verse 9. Therefore I will bewail thee with weeping of Jazer, the vine of Sibma, and I will water thee with my tears, O Heshbon, and Elia. And again, Elia is the, the ascending of God. For shouting for thy summer fruits, and for thy harvest is fallen. In other words, what would Christ say about being harvested as an untimely fig? In other words, being harvested uh, before the harvest. He would say, do not be harvested out of season as an untimely fig. And thy harvest is fallen. Again, desolation. Verse 10, and gladness is taken away, and joy out of the plentiful field, and the vineyards there, there shall be no singing, neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine in their presses. I have made their vintage shouting to cease. In other words, their idol worship has gotten them nowhere. Verse 11. Wherefore my bowels shall sound like an harp for Moab, and mine inward parts for Kirharesh, in other words, the wall of the potsherds. Again, this was another stronghold of Moab, verse 12. And it shall come to pass, when it is seen that Moab is weary on the high place, in other words, the places of worship, that he shall come to his sanctuary to pray, but he shall not prevail. 
In other words, it's not going to do them any good to go to their sanctuary and pray. Verse 13. This is the word of the Lord, or this is what the word of the Lord has spoken concerning Moab since that time. Verse 14. But now the Lord has spoken, saying, Within three years, as the years of an hireling, the glory of Moab shall be contemned, and all the great multitude in the remnant shall be very small and feeble. In other words, uh, it's going to come to nothing. Isaiah chapter 17 and verse 1. The burden of Damascus, and of course Damascus is in Syria. Damascus means uh, tame heifer or strong heifer. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city. It shall be a ruinous heap. Again, for the same reason as um, uh, Moab. It's going to be a ruinous heap. In other words, when Satan comes as the desolator, He's going to ruin the whole world. The whole world's going to uh, whore after him. Verse 2. And the cities of Aror are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Of course, this is after the return of Christ. Verse 3. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 4. And in that day, and there's that word again, in that day, it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. Uh, in other words, he, he's uh, going to be in famine. Verse 5. And it shall be when the harvestman gathereth corn, and reapeth the ears with his arm, it shall be as he that gathereth ears in the valley of Raphium. And the valley of the Raphium was the valley of the giants. Verse 6. Yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it, as a shaking of an olive tree. Two or three berries at the top of the uppermost bow, Four or five in the outmost fruitful branches thereof, saith the Lord God of Israel. In other words, there's going to be a, a few grapes. Verse 7. In that day shall man look to his maker, and his eyes shall have respect for the Holy One of Israel. And of course, in that day, we're talking about the day that Christ returns, the day of the Lord. That's when all this is going to come to pass. In other words, all this sorrow that we're reading about is how the people are going to feel at the return of Christ. Because they, have go they are going to have been deceived by the Antichrist. And only a small remnant are going to not have been deceived. Verse 8. And he shall not look to the altars, the work of his hands, neither shall respect that which his fingers have made, either groves or images. In other words, by that time, idol worship is going to be over with, including worship of the false Christ. Verse 9. In that day shall his strong cities be forsaken as a bow, and his uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there shall be desolation. And, uh, in other words, we're talking about a different kind of desolation now. There's not going to be any uh, men left to desolate by the desolator, but the people are still going to be in mourning for the desolation which where they had bowed down to the Antichrist. That's what the millennium is about. The millennium age is when Christ and his apostles and his elect are going to teach for a thousand years. But in the beginning, on that day when Christ returns, there's going to be wailing and gnashing of teeth, and people are going to be very sorrowful. It's even written that many are going to come up to Jesus and say, Oh Lord, have we not healed in thy name and cast out devils and done many wonderful works? And he's going to say, Get out of my sight, I never knew you. Verse 10. Because thou hast forgotten the Lord God of thy salvation, and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. Therefore thou shalt plant pleasant plants, 
and set it with strange slips. Verse 11. In that day shall thou make a plant to grow, and in the morning shall thou make the seed to flourish, but the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and desperate and of desperate sorrow. In other words, it's going to come to nothing all that they've done because why? Why? What did we just read? Because they are unmindful of their of their God that created them. Verse twelve. Woe unto the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas. What is the sea in the book of Revelation? What are the waters? The seas are the people. So you've got woe or warning to the multitude of many people. In other words, to all the people of the world. The one world government. Which make a noise like the noise of many seas. Or like the noise of the seas. In other words, again, the sea are the people. And to the rushing of nations. And we're talking about all the nations of the world. That make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. Well, a one world government would be considered mighty waters. Verse 13. And the nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them. And they shall flee afar off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountain before the wind. And the chaff is, of course, that which uh, the wheat brings forth. You, you could think of it as uh, blowing on a dandelion. Th th they're going to be blown away as far as uh, scattered. And like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. And a rolling thing would mean uh, anything that was round or even a log or stick that was rounded enough that when a whirlwind blows on it, it starts rolling and rolling and rolling and goes off into the distance. Verse 14. And behold, at evening tide, trouble. Evening tide is when the sun goes down. In other words, late in the day. And before the morning, he is not. The portion of them that spoil us, and the lot of them that rob us. And, of course, we're talking about the uh, Antichrist, spiritually speaking. Isaiah chapter 18 and verse 1. Woe unto the land of sh uh, land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Verse 2. That sendeth ambassadors by sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the water, saying, Go ye swift messengers to a nation scattered and peeled, to a people terrible from the beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden down, whose land and rivers have spoiled. In other words, they've been spoiled. Verse 3. All ye inhabitants of the world... And dwellers on the earth. How many did it say? All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth. See ye when he lifted up an ensign on the mountains. And when he bloweth a trumpet hear ye. Now what is the ensign that he's going to lift up on the mountain? And what mountain are we talking about here? Mount Zion. And when the trumpet blows. In other words the seventh trump. This is the return of Christ. Verse 4. For so the Lord said unto me, I will take my rest, and I will consider in my dwelling place like a cedar heat upon herbs, and like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. Verse 5. For afore the harvest, when the bud is perfect, and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, in other words, as it's, as it's ripening, he shall cut off the sprigs with pruning hooks and take away and cut down the branches. In other words, God is going to come back and he's going to prune the vine. Verse 6, spiritually speaking, verse 6. And they shall be left together unto the fowls of the mountains and the beasts of the earth and the fowls of, uh, shall summer upon them and all the beasts of the earth shall winter upon them. In other words, they're going to be on them uh, from summer to winter. Verse 7. 
And in that time shall the present be brought unto the Lord of hosts, of a people scattered and peeled, and from a terrible or and from a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden underfoot, whose land and rivers have been spoiled, or have spoiled, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion. In other words, this is where everyone is going to gather to at the return of Christ. Verse 19, or, or chapter 19 and verse 1. I don't know why I keep saying verse. I seem to have an affinity for doing that. Isaiah chapter 19, verse 1. The burden of Egypt. Okay, uh, what does Egypt represent? What did Egypt represent to Israel? Bondage. Hard labor. False gods. Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud, and shall come to Egypt, and her idols, and shall be moved at his presence. And the heart of Egypt, Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. And you could even liken this to um, uh, Jerusalem, which is spiritually called Egypt, and Sodom, and Gomorrah, as written of in the book of Revelation. Verse 22. But actually, uh, probably more Egypt itself. And I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians, and they shall fight one against another, his brother, and every one against his neighbor, city against city, and kingdom against kingdom. And what do we see going over there, going on over there in Egypt right now? Verse 3. And the spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof, and I will destroy the counsel thereof. And they shall seek to the idols, and to the charmers, and to them that have familiar spirits, and to wizards. In other words, the same thing, same kind of idolatrous uh, works that were done in Moab, that were done in Syria, that were done in Samaria, that were even done for in Jude Judea at times, verse 4. And the Egyptians will I give over to the hand of a cruel lord. Notice the lowercase l on lord. And a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the lord, the lord of hosts. Who do you suppose this fierce king is going to be? You'll notice the king is lowercase as well. A king of fierce countenance, understanding dark sentences. In other words, Satan Antichrist. Verse 5. And the waters shall fail from the sea, and the river shall be wasted and dried up. In other words, famine on the land. Verse 6. And they shall turn to the rivers turn the rivers far away, and the brooks of defense shall be emptied and dried up. The reeds and flags shall wither. In other words, they're going to have no defense. Why? Because they're going to seek to their little spirit charmers and their little seers and their false gods. Verse 7. And paper reeds by the brooks and by the mouth of the brooks and everything that is sown by the brooks shall wither and be driven away and be no more. Again, we're talking about famine. Verse 8, and fishers also shall mourn, and they that cast angle into the brooks shall lament, and they shall spread nets upon the waters, or they that spread nets upon the waters shall languish. In other words, they're not gonna they're not gonna draw any fish in. Verse 9. Moreover, they that work in fine flax, and they that weave networks, shall be confounded. Um, fine flax is what they use to make garments, and uh, they're going to be confounded, which is to say confused. Verse 11. And they shall be broken in the purposes thereof, all that make sluices and ponds for fish. Verse 11, Surely the princes of Zoan are fools, 
the counsel of the wise counselors of Pharaoh is become brutish, which means uh, stupid, uh, of ill counsel. How say ye unto Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings? Verse 12. Where are they? Where are thy wise men? Let them tell thee now. And let them know the Lord of hosts hath purposed, uh, let them know what the Lord of hosts hath purposed or proposed on Egypt. Verse 13. The princes of Zoan are become fools. The princes of Naf are deceived. They have also seduced Egypt, even they that are stayed of the tribes thereof. Verse 14. The Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof, and they have caused Egypt to err in every work, as a drunken man staggereth in his vomit. In other words, their uh, priests and their beliefs and their doctrines are also going to be false, and they're going to fall and worship this one, the Antichrist, along with the rest of the world. In other words, you're getting a spiritual type here from the peoples being mentioned in our time, it's going to be the whole world. But in these times, uh, you had the historical example, and they didn't know of the other lands, which we now inhabit as the world. But it was the world of their time. Verse 15. <clears throat> Neither shall there be any work for Egypt, which the head or tail, branch or rush may do. In other words, uh, what happens when you have no work? You don't get paid. And when you don't get paid, guess what? You don't have any money. And when you don't have any money, you can't buy food, you can't eat, and you starve to death. In other words, we're talking spiritually here. Their souls are famished. Verse 16. In that day shall Egypt be likened unto women. It shall be afraid and fear of the shaking of the hand of the Lord of hosts which shaketh over it. And um, the women used here as the uh, fairer sex, the more tender. In other words, in this time, men went to war, women did not. So that's why this analogy is used. Verse 17. And the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. Even everyone that maketh mention thereof shall be afraid in himself, because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts which he hath determined against it. Verse 18. In that day shall five cities of the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan, and swear to the Lord of hosts. One shall be called the city of destruction. Now, what was the language of the land of Canaan? Well, it was uh, very probably a derivative of Hebrew in the reality, but the language of Canaan was idol worship. In other words, that's what's inferred. Verse 19. In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. Now, there is a pillar standing at the border of Egypt right now, and I'm not saying this is, this is that pillar, but there is a pillar standing at the border of Egypt which was put there by Solomon at Nuweabia, the place where Moses parted the waters. And I did a study called Pharaoh's Chariots in the Real Red Sea of the Exodus in which you can see a picture of this pillar which is at the border of Egypt. In other words, it's at Nuweabia at the Red Sea. And it was recently moved and stood back up because it had fallen over and was laying at the water's edge. So they moved it inland, just a uh, about 500 feet across the highway, and stood the pillar back up. Just an interesting little tidbit for you in passing. Verse 20. And it shall be a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors. And he shall send them a savior a great one, and he shall deliver them. In other words, our Savior is going to deliver all the people. 
even the Egyptian. Verse 21, And the Lord shall be known of Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day. What day are we talking about here? The day of the Lord, the day when Christ returns as King of kings and Lord of lords. And they shall do sacrifice and oblation, yea, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord and perform it. In other words, the, even the Egyptians, even these hard-headed Egyptians, verse 22, And the Lord shall smite Egypt, and he shall smite and heal it, and he shall return even to the Lord, or, and they shall return even to the Lord, and he shall be entreated of them, and he shall heal them. In other words, again, during the millennium, during the day of the Lord. Verse 23, In that day there shall be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. In other words, even the Assyrians are going to uh, be uh, saved in this day. Verse 24, in that day shall Israel be a third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land. In other words, they're going to be accounted along with the other nations of the world. Even the Egyptians and the Assyrians, which obviously were Gentiles and not of Israel. But again, this has to do with the Holy of Holies, the veil of the temple being ripped so that all men could enter. In other words, Christ is going to heal them. During the millennium, they're going to learn truth and discipline, and many of them will be saved. Verse 25. Whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria the work of my hands, and Israel mine inheritance. In other words, they're all going to be treated equally at that time. Isaiah chapter 20 and verse 1. In the year that Tartan came to Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him and fought against Ashdod and took it, verse 2, at the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah the son of Amoz, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins and put off the shoe from off thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. Verse 3. And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and a wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia, verse 4, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians and uh, Egyptians prisoners and the Ethiopians captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. And now we're back before the day of the Lord. Because this is talking, in other words, they're going to be naked before the Assyrian. They're going to be naked in their shame before the Antichrist. In other words, they're not going to have any raiment to protect them. No gospel armor. Verse 5. And they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation, and of Egypt, their glory. Verse 6. And the inhabitant of this isle shall say in that day, Behold, such is our expectation whether we flee for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria, and how shall we escape? In other words, they're going to be looking for a way to escape, and in that day they're going to be given one. In other words, the Lord, our Savior Jesus Christ, is going to free them from the bonds of the king of Assyria, which is to say, a type of Satan, the Antichrist. Isaiah chapter 21 and verse 1. The burden of the desert... And of the sea. As whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it shall come from the desert, from a terrible land. And of course, remember what the sea is symbolic of from the book of Revelation. Verse 2 A grievous vision is declared unto me. A treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and, a spoil, and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam. Besiege, O media, all the signing thereof I have made to cease. Verse 3. Therefore my loins are filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. And again, the woman in travaileth pains to be delivered, the birth of a new age. 
And I was bowed down at the hearing of it, and I was dismayed at the seeing of it. In other words, this is another vision given to Isaiah, the son of Amos. Verse 4. My heart panted. Fearfulness affrighted me. The night of my pleasure hath turned into fear unto me. Verse 5. Prepare the table, watch in the watchtower, eat and drink, or eat, drink, arise, ye princes, and anoint the shield. In other words, uh, prepare for battle. And, and keep watch. Verse 6. For thus saith or, for thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go, set a watchman, and let him declare what he sees, or seeth. And we're all supposed to be watchmen. This is one of the things Christ would say. What I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. Verse 7. And he saw a chariot with a couple of horsemen, a chariot of asses, and a chariot of camels. And he hearkened diligently with much heed. In other words, he listened closely. Verse 8. And he cried, A lion, my lord. I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set in my ward whole nights. Verse 5. And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And all the graven images of her gods, notice the lowercase g, he hath broken unto the ground. Now, do you remember in the book of Revelation where it says almost exactly the same thing? Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. How is she fallen? Verse 10. O oh, my threshing of the corn of my floor, that I have heard of the Lord of hosts, or which I have heard of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have I declared unto you. Verse 11. The burden of Duma. He calleth me out of Seir. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? In other words, uh, what do you see out there in the darkness? And Duma and Seir, of course, having to do with uh, Edom's children, Esau, verse 12. And the watchman said, The morning cometh, also the night. If we inquire, inquire ye, return, come. Verse 13. The burden upon Arabia. In the forest of Arabia shall ye lodge, O ye traveling companies of Dedanim. And Dedan is, of course, south um, uh, Edom. Verse 14. And the inhabitants of the land of Tema, and uh, Tema also having to do with Esau, brought water to him that was thirsty, and he prevented their bread with him that fled. Verse 14. For they fled from the swords, and from the drawn sword, and from the bent bow, and from the grievousness of war. Verse 16. For thus saith the Lord unto me, Within a year, according to the years of an hireling, all the glory of Kedar shall fall. Verse 17. And the residue of the number of archers, the mighty men of the children of Kedar, shall be diminished. For the Lord God of Israel has spoken it. In other words, we're talking about the other lands here. You've got Edom involved, Arabia. Uh, Kedar is part of the land of Saudi Arabia. In other words, Kedar was of the children of Ishmael. It, uh, the word Kedar means dark, and it uh, is a play on the word Arab, which also means to darken or to, to be dark. It's not necessarily African dark. It, it just means to be dark. And uh, if you look at the people that we've covered in this lecture, they have been most of the ones that have been a trouble to Israel over the centuries and over the years. In other words, um, the Moabites, the Syrians, uh, the children of Ammon, which would include part of the Moabites. Um, the 
offspring of Esau. In other words, Dedan and Tema. Uh, in other words, the Edomites. And the Arab people. Um, Kedar. In other words, these have been a trouble to Israel all through Israel's history. And um, not only to Israel the state and Israel the people, but also to Israel the progeny of the European peoples. In other words, the lost tribes of Israel. Because there have been terrorist acts done by the uh, children of the Arabians at the behest of their imams and their leaders like Osama bin Laden, who um, probably uh, had a little help from the Kenites to uh, do these things that they did. But um, they have been a thorn in Israel's backside the whole time. They hate Israel even now. They hate the state of Israel and they want the Israelites out of there. But God gave the land of Israel uh, the state of Israel, in other words, the land of Canaan to Israel. And that's even written in the Holy Quran. And um, I've read the Quran. And uh, I know that Muhammad called Christ a prophet. Yet, one thing that you won't find in the Quran is Christ's words. In other words, you, you'll see that he blew on a bird in the desert and it flew away, or th that he did a few miracles, but you won't see his words. And you can better believe that if Muhammad thought Christ was a prophet, then he knew his words. And if he knew his words, he read them somewhere. And if he read them anywhere, it was in the new, newer writings and not from the Torah. I doubt very seriously whether uh, uh, Muhammad was a student of the Jewish Torah, and I know he wasn't a stu student of the Talmud. He may believe uh, in the Torah. In other words, he, he may have had access to an ancient Torah because the characters in the book of the Quran, such as Musa, which is Moses, and uh Ibrahim, which is Abraham, and all, all the way back to Adam. You know, the the Old Testament is covered within that religion. At least some of it is. But if he thought Christ a prophet, then he had to know of Christ's words. And the only way he could have known them, being 623 years after Christ, was that he had access to read some of the scrolls of the New Testament. Somewhere. So... Uh, beyond that, beyond the uh, Arabian people, the children of Islam, you might say, you've got the, uh, the children of Edom. In other words, the Russians. And this is not to say that all Russians are bad or all Russians are communists or anything like that. There are many good Christian Russians, but it was the uh, children of Edom, also with the help of the Kenites, that brought about socialism and communism. Those forces which are entering now even into our own country. And not only in the, our own country do you have them, but you also have a lot of uh, Muslim people who uh, want to turn this nation into Sharia law by caliphate or jihad. And, uh, you know, they did take down the Twin Towers. Uh, whether uh, they had help from the Kenites on that or not is debatable, and probably there's not a whole lot of debate to it, because y you can imagine that the Kenites will go to any extreme and play both sides of the field to get what they want. And what they want is world government. And to have world government amongst so many people which are not peaceable with each other, then certain things have to happen certain wars and certain treaties and certain laws and our constitution has to be done away with and our money has to fail and we have to become a voice in the chorus of their one world government so that they can usher in their father the antichrist at any rate as i made point of earlier when you try to read this book the bible if you try to read it in English only, you're going to be misled. 
Uh, I'm sorry, but there's no other way to say it. The Bible was translated fairly well, but as we learned in the first chapters that we covered here, if I had not translated a lot of those words as to their meaning for you, which this time I did, because it's important that you know these things, imagine trying to read that in English and understand what the message being conveyed by uh, Isaiah in his vision was. What was God trying to say? A lot of people would be lost to it. And you've got a lot of good pastors out there who don't even begin to study in the old languages, so how can they know these things? Christ said, I come in the volume of the book as it is written of me. Well, what book was around when Christ came? The Old Testament. And it spoke of him. And as you're reading in this book of Isaiah, it not only speaks of him, his coming in the flesh, but it speaks of his return on the great and terrible day of the Lord. So understand these things when you're studying our Father's Word. As always, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and my brothers and sisters of the people of the world, whether you be of Islam, or whether you be an atheist hearing this for the first time, or whether you be a Buddhist monk, or with the Dalai Lama, or whatever, the day is going to come when Christ shall appear. But before him shall come a false Christ. However, when the true Christ does appear, he is going to mend all these broken things and all these false doctrines and false religions. Many of these religions, and I know that in this country we have freedom of religion and there's a reason for that. But there is but one truth. And Islam and Judaism slash Zionism, which should actually be called Hebrewism, and Christianity all came from the same roots. And even Edom was once part of that. But Edom threw away his inheritance. In other words, he went secular, atheistic. And the children of Islam have been misled by imams and desert Arab, which their own Quran war or warns them against listening to, because they speak not the truth. Islam, uh, according to what I have read, is supposed to be a peaceful religion. And there are many peaceful Arabs in the world, peaceful children of Islam, no matter what color or race they come from. However, there's only one truth. And the life of Jesus Christ in the New Testament confirms the Old Testament, and the Old Testament confirms the New and all of these religions, though they have been split, were all once joined. And God is going to rejoin them at the return of Christ. And he's going to mend all these broken ties between this family, his family, the children of the earth, God's children. At any rate... It's always my prayer for you, brothers and sisters in Christ, that you will study your Father's Word in depth, even if it's only 20 or 30 minutes a day, and that you will dig deep into the original languages, if at all possible, so that you can understand these things, and learn the manners of speech of the times, so that you can glean grapes, which will be tasty to you as honey, so that you may understand our Father's Word. That's the only way you're going to learn. You can't just take my word for it, or some other man's word for it, or some other opinion, or some other doctrine. There's only one truth. One real truth. And if Christians realized that, there would not be so many denominations in the world. There would not be so many splits. In Christianity, you've got splits in denominations, uh, uh, roughly 120 different denominations of Christianity or so. And this all began with one religion, which Islam split away from, and which e Esau uh, sold his birthright from, and the children of Edom walked away from. And these other peoples who were the, the nephew of Abraham, the Moabites, and the, the Syrians... They all were the children of Abraham, the children of Adam, except for those created on the sixth day. And those created on the sixth day are as welcome as the rest to come to Christ, 
Because once Christ was sacrificed, he gave up everything so that he could fulfill the promise and open the Holy of Holies so that men could enter. Any man. Any man who would. So make sure you enter therein and speak to your Father and ask Him of the truth. He will tell you. May our Father bless you in all of your studies as you diligently seek His Word and His truth in this His most holy, precious Word in the volume of the book. Thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts. Which is um, uh, part of... um,